Hey readers, I'm so excited to do something new. We're always doing something new. Yes. I would like to introduce you to Quentin Robinson. He is featured in the book in A Defining Moment, and his story is called The Dance. It's my privilege today to introduce Quentin Robinson. He has lived a number of fascinating lives, everything from Deep Side Shallow Side to Camp Leatherneck to Naki Valley, and I'm so excited to share some of his stories today. Quentin, do you want to introduce yourself before we get started? Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, it was an amazing journey just having the conversations with you and and just telling telling my my story. I've been able to embody this dance life uh, for the past 23 years of my life. So uh, my name is Quentin Robinson. I'm from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, uh, and I've been dancing for 23 years. And the style that I do is called popping, which is in the hip hop uh, genre of things. Oh, that's amazing. First of all, congratulations on your engagement. I saw well, the great news. So. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Let's start with a couple people have asked me who read the book. What what is deep side, shallow side? And I think I done my research after you and I spoke. Perhaps I didn't describe it enough. Maybe bring to life what it's like living there. All right. Well, deep shot, deep side, shallow side. Uh, there's a place called Lauder Hill in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It's right off Sunrise. Uh, deep side was a it's, a, it's a neighborhood in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, in Lauder Hill. And shallow side, well, Lauder Hill is the neighborhood in general. Mm -hmm. It's split in two by the freeway. Yeah. On one side, you had shallow side. And on the other side, you had deep side. I lived on deep side, friends, family lived on shallow side also, but there was always a rivalry. Uh, at times it could be very dangerous. Uh, mm. But as a dancer, we had that, that key and access through multiple neighborhoods that most people were, weren't welcome. Yeah, I thought because this was super interesting. Mm -hmm. They knew who we were. They were like, oh, all right, yeah, you, you legit that dance and jit is like, you know, Small kid, little guy. You the jit that dance, right? Oh, my little cousin. And these are like dudes with dreads, like me, but like goals and tattoos everywhere, and yeah. just like literal like gang bangers, like most likely carrying a gun. But everyone knew how to do what we call city boy. It was a style of dance, so you could have mm -hmm. like artists, the hardened criminals, but they knew how to city boy. They knew that groove that. It's like a, it's, it's something in Fort Lauderdale that you just can't get anywhere. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the way you describe it, you're so it's so positive. I was just looking back at the book. Th this area is one of it was rated one of the most dangerous cities in the world. Right. Yeah. And and what you described to me earlier in terms of like people getting shot in the street and walking up, seeing a cluster of people and walking away because you're like something not good is happening there. As a really little kid, mm -hmm. you're on the streets finding this stuff. But you saw so early on, like extraordinarily early on, that dance was something that could bring people together. So how did you discover dance? Oh, well, uh, not so good of a thing that I did, but I skipped school <laughs> one day. Um, <laughs> I skipped school one day uh, because... I didn't have enough money to catch the bus to school and mm -hmm. I wasn't going to walk all the way to school. Mm -hmm. uh, I go to the bus stop, put all of my chains inside of the bus. I'm, I'm giving you my real effort of me trying to get to school. I put all of my <laughs> chains inside of the bus and I was about like, I think like 20 cents short. Mm. And I look up at the bus driver and the bus driver is looking at me and I'm like, no. He's like, nope. It's like, all right, well, I had to go back home. So. I went back home and I popped in a tape and it was breaking. There's a, a scene in breaking where he's in mm -hmm. the back of the store dancing with a broom. And I jumped up and I immediately did the same exact routine for the first time. Mm -hmm. And my brother walks in and I'm like, oh, okay. And he asked me what I was doing and I showed him what I was doing. And it was one of those moments of like, how did, you can do that, you know? Mm -hmm. And then the very next time at school, he just like, one of those crowds after school, yeah. I look in and I notice that one group has on white gloves and the other yeah. group has on soldier rags. And those two mm -hmm. groups called the soldier rags and the white gloves, they're battling in the street dancing. And this is, this is a real thing. After school, crowd's going crazy. It's not a fight. And yeah. I get pushed in. 
So some young people will be watching this, I suppose, and they're going to have a question, which is, what's a tape? What's a, <laughs> you, what's popped a, in a ta- you popped in a tape. Oh, a tape. <laughs> oh, it's this, this ancient thing that you used to have a camera that you had to turn. No, I'm just kidding. But no, there's a, there's a, a VHS. So it's yeah. a video phone. Oh, I don't know what it is. Yeah, it's I don't know what it's for either. But yeah, but there's a tape that goes into a VCR. And you pop that in and you get to see things. It's a step before CDs. We had tape that we had to rewind and watch everything in reverse until it got back. (laughs) Oh, I forgot about (laughs) watching it in reverse. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so this is your childhood. Dance is kind of getting you through it. And you're able to travel over the highway to both sides of the neighborhoods as one of the the very few kids who can. Then you ended up at Camp Leatherneck. So how did you get there? And what is and where is Camp Leatherneck? All right. So um, from high school, instead of pursuing like the sports and track and field and everything, I made a five day decision uh, (laughs) to go from regular graduate of high school on a Monday and flying out to Paris Island in Beaufort, South Carolina on Friday to go to the Marine Corps. I didn't know exactly what the Marine Corps was. I knew the army, air force and all in the Navy, but I did not know what the Marine Corps was for some reason, but I walked in the office And I knew my situation back at home, like my family, lovely. Like my family Mm -hmm. is amazing. Never had any type of issue or falling out. My family is amazing. But I knew the situation that we're in. I had to make something happen. Mm -hmm. Camp Leatherneck is out in Afghanistan. Um, And it's like a joint operation base where we have all branches and other countries and CPATs and and all of the different TCNs that come in and from other countries like Kabul, uh, Afghanis, people from India come in from Mm -hmm. like uh, all of these different areas, they come in and they do joint operations on base. And then you brought dance to Afghanistan. So you could feel this tension in the camp, like, I mean, just in the midst of violence, front line. So what did you do on your off hours? Tell everyone about that. (laughs) All right, so uh, shout out to my my buddy Daryl Albritton. Uh, his nickname was DJ No Request on campus <laughs> on, on the base because he didn't care what anyone requested. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it was it was amazing. Me and him got together, and we were making good money out in Afghanistan during this time. So we ended up putting money together and saying, "Hey, we're gonna throw a dance competition on base." Yeah, and everyone's invited except the commanders, and we're just gonna have a party at the USO. So we would get lights, we would get an entire, you know, we only had laptops and speakers, so we didn't have the DJ set, but we had his music, which was a ton of music, and we would set up, send flyers out around base, kind of like a police academy type deal, where we're just doing something completely wrong, <laughs> that we're doing it wrong, but we're gonna have fun. If we get caught, we get caught. We would throw these parties in everyone. I mean, the thing would be packed. The USO, people outside, the building is like, is literally like a Miami nightclub awesome. on base. <laughs> everyone with like rifles bouncing around. And so it was crazy in there. It was amazing. Never had an issue, no fights, no nothing. Everyone just throwing mm-hmm. down and having a great time on, on, on Camp Leatherneck. So there is a character. I mean, he's a person who you you worked with and oh, lived with. A character too. <laughs> oh my gosh, we are not going to talk about Fazel because yeah. that's why people have to read the book. I mean, just <laughs> the coolest <laughs> stories and the way you talk about people. I actually think, I actually think the way you talk about people says more about your heart, Quentin. Like the way you see people and the way that you reflect on on things just shows how you how optimistic you are and how you see the positive in everything it's it's extraordinary thank you thank you he it's i don't know i we we have to gauge and we do that the moment we meet anyone like yeah. back at home i grew up we grew up in a way that was we don't speak to each other that's not a thing that it was purposefully mm-hmm. rude that was just part of the culture it's like when i walk by you there's no like hey good morning like i had to get used to that out of like the military almost, and even past it a little bit, you know, mm. because we have to say good morning to our drill instructors. We have to right. 
have that respect. We always have respect for adults, like, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, always. Right. That was a must. But when it came down to strangers or like just a random person, adult, friend, or not friend, but a stranger walking by, there was no smile and wave or anything. It was just like, my business, I'm on mine, we're good. I find joy being able to step out of that zone as a, you know, as a grown man, stepping out of that zone and and being able to like meet someone like in a in a in an equal spacing. You know, mm. but at the same time, I know where my settings are. There's different settings in different mm. ways, at different times to click that on. Like I have to be diverse in that way of knowing mm. when to and when not to at the same time. Mm. Gosh, it makes you think like, what if everybody had that sensitivity, that cultural sensitivity? <laughs> How different would we uh, be living our lives right now, huh? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm going to take a total pause from our story right now and just say, you are a black man wearing a shirt that says, I am black history, sitting in America, an artist. I am an Asian woman sitting in Shanghai, surrounded by books. <laughs> <laughs> On the outset, I don't know that we could look any more different. And yet you're one of my favorite people. And I think we have more in common than most people because it's a heart thing, you know? Once you get past or you you witness or not even witness, you experience multiple people and multiple environments and you become the minority, you become the majority, you start to have a different set of of empathy and you you, you have a different set of 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 just cultural awareness to be okay yeah. in front of someone completely different and still have that open conversation that you would with a buddy in the same exact grouping as you or in the right. same environment and in, in cultural setting as you. So mm -hmm. you get to step outside of that. You get to have those conversations with people that are outside of your norm. Yeah. And you're open that way. You find people. I find people like you. I'm like... <laughs> Hey, and it's it's an exciting moment to be able to yeah. see you and like, hey, what's up? And I yeah, know. that's I, I feel like that's a big difference when it comes down to being able to get out and have that experience as minority and majority. Yeah. I think that's such an interesting phrase, this minority and majority, because something that drives me crazy is that phrase model minority. I totally reject that. And I might be making controversial statements now. Here's well, why I reject it. Because if one minority group is a model, what are you saying about the other minority groups? It's not us versus them. It's all of us against racism. And if yeah. we actually look at the all of us, we are the majority. That's exactly where I was going with that. Because again, when you are the majority, yeah. that means someone else's view as not being in your group. Yes. Whenever you're the majority, whenever you're the minority, there's another group that's mm -hmm. that's separated. Yeah. It, that's separated from you. So all the grouping of minority and majority just means separate. That's where that disconnect of someone like myself sitting here and someone like you mm -hmm. sitting way over there can have <laughs> this type of relationship because there's yeah. always a them. So you have moved all over, literally all over the world. You have learned how to flex your style to the environment around you. You see beauty in things and people. You look beyond the superficial and we can build a deep, meaningful friendship regardless of where we live, what we look like. H how do you think you do that? And what do you wish other people would do more? Uh, I feel like number one is... I'm no better than anyone that I'm walking towards. In my head, I can do everything right and feel good about my day, which is perfectly fine. Mm. But that person who you're walking towards that that you you hold that you don't hold yourself up next to, like that person may have a kid. That person may have an entire following that feels like they are like the idle person yeah. to look at. And as just me walking towards them, who am I to say they aren't who they are? I feel like approaching anyone, especially out in Naka Valley, I didn't approach them like, oh, 
the refugee is on the camp and he's sad and I need to to be a <laughs> a, a a safe haven for them. Mm. They just fled genocide, walked yeah. across a country, made it to this camp alive. Yeah. yeah. They're stronger than me and everyone around me. Yeah. So the last thing, the last thing that I should do is look at that person as anything less, regardless of the situation that they're in. I agree. I think two things pop out. There is, haha, pop, get it? <laughs> one <Yeah>. is, sorry, <laughs> it's early uh, morning. Uh, one is empathy. You have a way of seeing people um, in a very empathetic way. And I think the other thing is humility. I mean, people have, uh, people listening have not seen you move yet. <laughs> so when you say you are no better, no different than anyone else, I don't agree. <laughs> But it's that like it's that mindset of empathy, curiosity and humility that I think you possess that allows you to build these meaningful relationships and see beyond what people look like on the outside so that you're not thinking, oh, you're different than me or you're the you're them, like you said before. Mm -hmm. Rather, it's like, hey, we might have something in common or there might be something I can learn from you. In the Marine Corps, we there's a small well, not a small, there's a big pride on walking into a room and or walking towards someone hostile and immediately having them have the fear of God get struck into their system like, oh no, I'm in trouble. They're mm. here. <laughs> you know, like yeah. that is the thing that that you want to be able to possess also. But mm -hmm. that's a part of that job. So the last thing I would want, because 6'2, I'm 210, mm. to walk into a room and have anyone judge me off of a visual mm. because I've been judged off. I've been judged visually purposefully and mistakenly purposefully being in the military. We work on strength. We work on presentation. We work on everything. The way we speak, we work on that. So if there's a fear that comes out nine times out of 10, we wanted that to happen. Mm -hmm. But when it comes down to me walking into a room to do a talk and someone asked me for my credentials because they don't think I belong there until mm. the organizer comes out and tells that person to find us something to eat. <laughs> that's one of those things that's like, yeah, I, that, that sucks, you know? So yeah. Yeah. why would I turn around and do the same thing when it happens more than often to me a lot, you know? So yeah. Uh, yeah. with that, I feel like that's something that when you say, something that all of us could have is approach someone or when you approach someone, just realize that you don't know anything that happened up until that moment of you meeting them. Mm -hmm. uh, and lastly, I'll say I've been at an event and this is something that I apply to everything else that I do. I've been at an event where I perform living in Montana and everyone, every for every five questions, three and a half questions are, well, four and a half questions are, so how did you get to Montana? There was one point where I did an event and I had like person number 12 asking me that question after <laughs> answering 11. And in my head, I was like, oh, I don't feel like answering this. But yeah. something stopped me immediately. And I thought about it. I was like, this is this person's first time. Right, asking. right why Missoula? Even though I've been asked so many times, this yeah. is this person's first time asking me. So take mm. that, that thing that was getting ready to like grind your gear and just get rid of it because this person is just wanting to know they're in front of you. They took the time to stop and approach and ask yeah. you and have a conversation, have the conversation. And then when you're done with that conversation, sprint to a mic and scream out, why Missoula? <laughs> why Missoula? So, <laughs> but that's the that's the idea yeah. that you want to walk through the day with. I love that. That's super. We're inspiring because I can totally relate to that. You get asked something over and over, or you hear the same thing over and over, and you get really frustrated. You're like, really again? But I'm going to use that, which is no, not again. This is this person's first time asking or making that mistake or challenging something. Oh, I love that. So tell me what you're doing now. 
So started a nonprofit organization. Um, it started out as just the LLC. It start, well, actually it started out with me dancing and I got connected into Hatch through a great friend of ours, Elkie. Um, Elkie! Elkie! <laughs> <laughs> that sparked my, my love for movement even more. Mm-hmm. It got me into a, a, a mindset to think bigger outside of just, oh, I want to teach. How can I implement movement into everyone's every day and not just mm. a moment in time? How mm. to expand that that one lesson into an entire lifetime of right. movement. And mm. created a nonprofit organization called Movements for Movements. And with this nonprofit organization, we've been able to, to hit locations like Africa, multiple states. Uh, we had a few things set up in Guatemala right before the pandemic hit, but yeah. we're going to revisit all of those locations. And uh, we do movement workshops focused on uh, therapeutic movement and dance to help with uh, to help individuals, families, organizations, schools, anything, anyone uh, who may suffer or or who's gone through mental or physical traumas and movement with disassociation. And we apply specific programs to individuals or groups to help build that relationship or to help build relationships through movement. That's awesome. In in the book, I won't tell, read any of the stories, but when we talk about establishing movements for movements, you were pretty much invited right away to fill to, to facilitate retreats and workshops all over North and South America. And what I thought was really interesting is you've lived in these extraordinary places, right? You've lived through major conflict, and yet sometimes it's in the most ordinary circumstances. So you were facilitating a workshop at a public high school, and you talked about how you witnessed new levels of understanding unfolding between teachers and students who saw each other every day, yet struggled to understand one another. And I wrote, as he watched, Quentin marveled, cultural barriers aren't just impediments that need to be broken down between Indians and Pakistanis from two war-torn countries. Movement can help us find unity through compassion right here in our daily lives. Uh, So with that, it's one of those things where the movement workshops that we do between, uh, well, let's just put it in a school setting. Mm -hmm. Um, By the time that workshop is complete and the goal of the workshop is to open the student and humanize the instructor. Yeah. Because in the setting is usually sit down, shut up, listen to me, raise your hand and tell me what I just told you. The goal is to get in, humanize the teacher, open up the student and have that conversation. Um, And we use movement in that conversation. Mm. And we found that some teachers and students, they were just missing each other by a little bit every single day. They were just missing each other just by a little bit. That student that come in that came in late for a week and the teacher who uh, may have a family member that was that that's been lost. Once they run across each other, that's that's tension. Mm-hmm. That that's immediate tension. So the teacher finds out oh, the reason why the student is late, and this is through the entire workshop, Right. the student sleeps in the car with his two parents. Right. The student doesn't get breakfast in the morning. Mm. The student has to go to the vending machine, and this is why they always raise their hand and come back with snacks, and they're eating in class when I tell them not to. Yeah. They find these things out, and they immediately, it, it changes that dynamic. Mm-hmm. And that opens up a different lane of of trust, respect, and understanding. I mean, the simplest way it sounds like it, to articulate movements for movements is you're one by one and then group by group teaching people how to see each other and the world through your perspective, which is that empathy, the humility, and the curiosity. It's amazing. Where can people find movements for movements? So uh, movementsformovements.com. You can go to our Instagram page at movements for movements uh, our facebook at movements for <laughs> movements the number four awesome i'll post that at the bottom as well 
Quinn, thanks for chatting with me again. Every time I talk to you, I learn something, I'm inspired, and I remember why I love you so much. And I think everybody else who's listened will too. So go to Movements for Movements and support him and this amazing nonprofit organization. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited for everything that you have going on, especially with the new book and the launch. <laughs> and um, I'm grateful to know you. Thank you so much. I am grateful to know you too, my friend. Thank you so much. Have a great day.